All right, welcome everyone, as Sala mentioned, to the new decade. And I'm handing off to Alex to present Building Membranes in JavaScript. Version three. Mm -hmm. Um, so just so everybody to bring everybody up to speed on some of the background behind this um, a couple of years ago, Mark and I gave co authored a talk before TC 39 on this very subject. Um, with the aim being to bring people up to date on what was state of the art on membranes at the time. Um, afterwards. We realized that we wanted to revise the talk, or at least I should revise the talk, to aim at a more general audience. Um, TC39 being spec maintainers, and the intended audience for this is to go after the more general JavaScript community at large. So with that, um, I would welcome interruptions at any point. Um, I would prefer, of course, notes put on the slides themselves if you have that capability. Um, if someone could test to make sure that that capability is working, please let me know now. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to ramble on. And again, feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, this is not a dry run. This is just a walkthrough to the best of my ability of what I expect to say. So what is a membrane? Well, on the left here, we have an HTML document with several elements. Each of those elements is a trusted object implemented natively by the browser. On the right side, we see a JavaScript that wants to interact with the document and its elements. This code should be allowed to do a lot, but if it has access to all the API the browser has, that can be dangerous. A membrane is simply a way to keep trusted code separate from untrusted code in both directions. Or it allows code to be mutually suspicious of each other so that they don't accidentally trample on each other. So let's talk a little bit about uh, objects and interfaces. Interfaces are a concept that is not very well known or defined in JavaScript itself. Um, an object is a collection of properties, some of which are functions, which we call methods. This may sound obvious, but it's important. You refer to other values by the object and a property name. In C++, some properties are private and not accessible outside the class. Others are public, but we may not want all such public methods exposed to foreign code. It's common to define interfaces, such as document here, to explicitly name what foreign code may see. But the interface itself doesn't implement the restrictions. It's just a description of what the program wants to expose. Regarding web standards, there are standard interfaces for most document object model or DOM objects. Browsers use these interfaces to create restricted access to these underlying objects. A proxy, by contrast, is a special object which emulates other objects. In JavaScript, it's primarily composed of two parts, a shadow target and a proxy handler. Through most of these slides, I'll follow the convention of using the semicircles for proxies and full circles for actual objects. This is standard whenever people talk about membranes. In order to guarantee that a proxy obeys the rules of JavaScript, the proxy must store any knowledge it has about an object on another object, the shadow target. The JavaScript engine will enforce invariance against the proxy object by comparing how the proxy responded to what the shadow target records. The shadow target is almost always a unique object closely mirroring the basic properties of the actual target object. For instance, if the proxy is tracking an array, the shadow target must also be an array. The proxy handler is a combination of 13 methods, each of which implements a trap for different behaviors. The own keys trap, for instance, returns an array of strings and symbols, which are keys of the shadow target. One nice thing about, feature, about proxies is that you don't have to define all the properties of a proxy before the user sees it, at least most of the time. The proxy traps allow for defining properties when you look them up. 
So we defer the work necessary for filling a proxy's properties until they're needed. In a normal proxy, you would define the shadow target's property to be the same as the actual target's property. However, membranes prefer to define these shadow properties as pointing to other proxies, and I will explain why in a little bit. Finally, JavaScript proxies may be revoked at any time. This disconnects the proxy from the shadow target and renders the proxy inert. Any attempt to use the proxy after it has been revoked will throw an error. The shadow target is then subject to garbage collection. Another critical component of membranes is the weak map. Basically, a weak map is a hash table or a dictionary that holds references to their keys and values weakly. We can add key value two tuples to a weak map at any time. For a given weak map, the keys are unique, but many keys can point to the same value. If the only references to a particular key are in weak maps, then no JavaScript code in the world can get that key out of any weak map. The key is unreachable and subject to deletion. If the key is also the only way to reach a value, then the value is also subject to, to deletion. The concept of membranes is why we have proxies and weak maps in the first place. On the next slide, I'll show how proxies, proxy handlers, weak maps, and objects combine to implement a membrane. Let's just start by assuming we have a membrane and two object graphs, which we'll call wet and dry for convenience. Suppose we have a dry proxy to the document object. Already there are several relationships defined. Excuse me, we have two proxy handlers and generally two weak maps. One weak uh, map. Alex, I'm just gonna interject. Uh, in, in presenting uh, these concepts to other audiences, one of the things that I found is that uh, people like uh, uh, colors like blue and yellow as the names much more than they like uh, terms wet and dry. Uh, wet and dry for me have, have a wonderful intuition, but especially as you're going to get, I, I've seen your slides before, as you're going to get into multi-way things where you have uh, uh, additional things besides wet and dry, uh, having them simply be other colors at that point really makes compellingly more sense than, ha than introducing concepts like damp. So, so obviously, don't, don't try to change it mid-stride here, but that's advice for future presentations. OK, I'll have to watch this video to capture that, unless you've put a note in the uh, slides. Um, I respond in two different ways. Number one, think about colorblindness. Number two, um, following the conventions that have already been established when talking about membranes. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I started opposed, off following that. But I'm, I'm just counterpointing. Yeah, no, you're, you're, those, are, those are definitely issues. Um, altogether, I think the balance of considerations uh, for, for me seems to argue towards the colors. But I'll, 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 we can return to your presentation. I just wanted to interject that. Fair enough. Um, let's see. We have a membrane and two object graphs, which for the purposes of this convention, um, I'm calling wet and dry. Suppose we have a dry proxy to the document object. Already there are several relationships defined. We have two proxy handlers and generally two weak maps. Uh, we'll come back to one of the exceptions to that later on. One weak map is specifically for keys in the wet object graph or trusted object graph pointing to values in the dry object graph or untrusted. The other weak map defines the reverse operation, keys in the dry object graph pointing and, key and values in the wet object graph. To get the body property of the dry document proxy, the membrane does several things. First, the dry proxy handler will get the request and look up the, document, the document object in the dry weak map based on the shadow target. Then the JavaScript engine grabs the body object for the return trip. The membrane asks the weak, wet weak map if there is a proxy for that body object. And the weak map says, sorry, I don't have one. So the weak, weak membrane goes to work. It creates a shadow target in roughly the shape, same shape as the body object. It creates a proxy from the shadow target and the dry proxy handler. In the dry weak map, it, creates, it sets the shadow target as a key pointing to the body object. 
And then it does the same using the proxy as a key also pointing to the body object. Then in the weak wet map, it sets the body object as a key pointing to the proxy. The membrane pulls the shadow target for the document project proxy and sets its body prox property to the new proxy. Finally, oops, I went a little too fast there. Lost my timing. Um, sorry, guys. Where was I? Finally, the body, the dry proxy handler returns the new body proxy color to, to the color. I got to work on this, guys. And on the dry object graph, it looks like the document proxy has a property named body pointing to the body proxy. I apologize for the timing. Again, still pretty rough. Well, what about looking up the owner document of the body element? Well, that's much easier because there's already a proxy for the document. The dry proxy handler gets the request and looks up the body object in the dry weak map based on the shadow target. The JavaScript engine grabs the document object for the return trip. And the membrane asks the wet weak map if there is a proxy for that document object. Wet weak map returns that proxy. And after ensuring the document proxy is defined as the owner document pro property of the body proxy's target, the dry proxy handler returns the document proxy and the work is done. So there's 13 traps that are implemented for proxy handlers. And there's a, ref a similar object called the reflect global object, which does the same thing for ordinary objects. It is intended as a convenience for proxy handlers to use. Basically, the idea is for each of these traps, there is a corresponding reflect trap that the proxy handler can use on the shadow target and or on the underlying original value. So let's talk a little bit about object graphs. This is yet another building block piece towards membranes in general. From graph theory, I'm sorry, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read from the slide. We have an object graph, which is a collection of objects called nodes and the relationships between them, which we call edges. In a browser, the HTML elements combine to form a single object graph. And here we have the edges drawn as property names from one node to another. It's worth pointing out that where these nodes appear on the graph has zero relationship to the expense of going from one node to another. Aside from the obvious that from, to get from the HTML element to the title element, you have to go through, through the head element first. I could place the title node on the far right side of this slide, and it wouldn't change the graph at all. For the purpose of membranes, we can mostly ignore the time complexity. Membranes add overhead in practice, a considerable amount of it, but the theory does not rely on this. Typically, there is a second object graph which JavaScript code has access to and which closely mirrors the first object graph. This is where you have proxies and uh, objects on the left side. First, I'll show the properties of these proxies. Now I show the connections of these proxies to their underlying objects. This brings us to membranes. A membrane is the coordinator between object graphs. It establishes rules for how object graphs talk to each other via specialized proxy handlers, which manage proxies within individual object graphs. I call these proxy handlers object graph handlers because that's what they do. They manage all the objects and proxies in a particular graph and in concert with the membrane, convert objects from one object graph to proxies in another. Each object graph handler is responsible for creating new proxy objects as necessary. For instance, I may have an internal object graph with thousands of nodes and edges, but my public object graph only has one node in it initially. This is simply leveraging the initialize on demand traits of proxies. If we don't need to build up a property, we don't build it. This has an important effect. Whenever we look up the property of a membrane proxy, and that property is also an object, the membrane converts that property into a matching membrane proxy. This is how the membrane keeps the object graphs separate from each other. The transformation from one graph to another happens automatically in the membrane and its supporting code 
before the caller ever sees that property. Traditionally, a membrane has two object graphs, one of which has the name wet and the other dry. The names have no significance other than to distinguish one object graph from another. Membranes are also responsible for wrapping inputs from the foreign object graph. Here we have the web page script wanting to define an event listener on an element. To support this, the membrane creates a proxy listener to the event listener and passes that proxy to the underlying target's code. Finally, distortions. Normally, a membrane proxy should mirror the behaviors of the corresponding object perfectly. Distortions are rules for explicitly changing the, the appearance of a proxy so it doesn't mirror the original object's behaviors completely. One common distortion is in hiding properties. JavaScript doesn't yet have the concept of private properties. It's just a convention that developers don't inspect or change certain properties of an object. But there's nothing in ordinary JavaScript objects to prevent it. Proxies can do that using the proxy handler traps. Because there are so many different ways to change the appearance of a proxy, and many fall into distinct categories, we call them distortions as a shorthand. We'll cover them in more detail later. So why are membranes important? First, there's security against untrusted access. This is simply saying that access through a membrane proxy to its original target is restricted in very specific ways, which the membrane creator must specify. Recall that a proxy only emulates an object. This means that the proxy handler determines what properties the proxy exposes. Excuse me. Suppose Alice provides a car object to Bob, where Bob wants to install a 9-volt battery. But Alice doesn't trust Bob, certainly not to pop the hood. Alice wants her car's battery to be a private or hidden property. Sure, she could write a setter function to validate the argument, but she doesn't even want Bob to know there's a place to put a battery. So when Bob tries to set the battery property of the car, he can set it on his proxy for the car, but the membrane Alice has in place stops that battery from getting into her car. But if Bob wants to get his battery back, how can he do that? The membrane blocked it, so Alice doesn't know about it. The membrane has to keep track of Bob's battery to give it back to him when he wants it later. And again, my timing is a little bit off here. Well, what about the other direction? Again, consider the car's battery property to be private. And let's assume that Bob has already set that battery on his proxy. Alice then says she wants to set her battery property. Well, if the proxy handler for the car wasn't written correctly, this property would propagate all the way out to Bob's proxy. And then when Bob went to look for his battery, it wouldn't be his battery anymore. And that's bad. Here's another example of why membranes can be interesting. And admittedly, this one is more theoretical than known at this time. If there's a shared car object and Alice wants to set a windshield, maybe the membrane will allow that. If Bob wants to set a set of windshield wipers on the car, maybe the membrane will allow that too. But if the windshield and the wipers don't work together well, bad things can happen. Theor theoretically, a membrane can prevent this kind of problem. So what do we expect from a membrane? First of all, perfect mirroring. Primitive values get passed through, at least by default. Non-primitive values, objects, functions, arrays, etc., they are wrapped in proxies by default. And through the defined API constraints, if there are any, property lookups and work functions work just as if we were under interacting with the underlying objects. Second, we have impenetrable boundaries, one proxy per object graph for each non-primitive, which the membrane creates only as needed. And all the proxies for an object graph can be revoked in one call if there's a problem or if we want to shut down that object graph. Third, we have support, support for distortions to the perfect mirroring. Alice can set and later get properties on, on DOM elements, which don't propagate to Bob's underlying implementation. 
When you can consider what objects are in an object-oriented language, there are a few simple distortions we can define. We already mentioned hiding properties. In JavaScript, what we would do is twofold. First, we would prevent the property name from showing up in the list of the object's own keys. Second, any attempt to look up that property returns undefined. Another common distortion would be storing unknown pro properties locally on the proxy. Perfect mirroring means new properties would pass through to the underlying object properly wrapped, of course. This distortion means the new property doesn't pass through, but whenever you look, up, look it up on the proxy, you still get that property. This distortion means manipulating a few distinct traps, such as own keys, get own property descriptor, define property. Mozilla Developer Network calls these expandos, the properties. A related distortion is making deletions of properties local. That simply means if you execute a delete operation on a proxy, that delete doesn't go to the underlying object. Uh, gentlemen, I have no idea what time it is. I don't know if I'm getting close to the end of the allotted time for this meeting. You're doing fine. OK. Yeah. yeah. You're doing great, Alex. And and the, oh, by the way, the presentation is great. OK. Um, anyway. These three rules combine to define a basic whitelist in my view. And my inspiration for these is Mozilla's DOM proxy model. Another distortion is revoking an entire object graph in a single API call. Revocation's initial motivation is garbage collection, but it also applies to the principle of least privilege. Once Bob no longer needs access to his object graph, why does his object graph continue to exist? So a proxy gives us all of these capabilities already for an individual object. Membranes are the equivalent for entire object graphs. So there are membranes in use right now, although most people don't realize this, which is sort of the point of having membranes in the first place. One very popular membrane Im implementation is in Mozilla Firefox, the web browser. Firefox calls these cross compartment wrappers. They provide a layer of abstraction and security between the browser's document object model or DOM and the web's vast multitude of JavaScript files. The wrappers are the membrane proxies. An added bonus is that when a web page unloads, Firefox will revoke all those proxies for the web page at once. This means the long proxies no longer point to the underlying DOM nodes and the browser can reclaim the memory safely. Dr. Van Cutsum also tells us about a project from Salesforce called Observable Membrane. This library focuses, as the name describes, on observing interactions in an object graph. As a concept, it's quite nice. It's an instant audit trail of what the users are interacting with. More importantly, the rules of the observable membrane travel from the original objects the membrane wraps to any other object in the object graph. So let's talk a bit about the history behind membranes and their concepts. We have Dr. Mark Miller, who is actually on this call, as everyone knows, and Dr. Tom Van Cutsum. The two of them worked together to invent the concept of a membrane or to evolve it from pre-existing concepts that I do not know about. Um, Mark, I was hoping we could get photos of you and Tom. We can talk about that offline. Or we can drop this slide if you're really uncomfortable about that. Uh, I'm fine with the slide. I'm fine with sending you a photo. I would like you to drop the doctor. Uh, I just I just never use that in describing myself. Um, oh, and I would like my middle initial. I'll, I'll send you an email about all that. OK. Uh, presumably, I dropped the doctor title from Tom as well. Um, I just uh, want to make sure the two of you are on relatively equal footing here. Yeah. Uh, so ask Tom about that. I don't, I don't want to speak for Tom on that. Um, Okay, I'm just trying to be respectful of both of you here. Yep, yep, I appreciate that. So traditionally, membranes have followed a model of cell membranes in biology. You can either be inside the membrane, which is where the term wet came from, or outside the membrane, dry. Only the membrane proxies, which the membrane specifically creates, may breach this cell wall. If anything else can, that's a bug. <laughs> 
The idea is that each object on the wet side may have a dry proxy, and each object on the dry side may have a wet proxy. Beyond that, nothing on the dry object graph knows anything about the wet object graph, including its existence and vice versa. Um, this is a slide that is not complete. Mark, I'm gonna need your help with this. I'll just pause here for just a moment, to give people a chance to read it and reflect. So in September 2018, I came up with a new model for describing membranes based on old-fashioned old Euclidean geometry. My introduction to graph theory in college was circles and lines, which can fit very easily in a two-dimensional plane. Likewise, the tree structures we use for the document object model can fit in two dimensions, attributes being a special case, but that's not really relevant for this. Well, if an object graph lives in a plane, then two object graphs can form two parallel planes. The fact they're parallel means they can never intersect. So again, objects in one graph cannot touch objects in another. Keeping the idea of full circles for objects works, but not semicircles for proxies. So I can replace the semicircle with a hemisphere for a proxy with the flat side facing the underlying object. Similarly, I replace the circle for an object with a sphere. Edges remain lines in each object graph's planes. Finally, to clarify how a proxy relates to an object, I added cylinders perpendicular to the object planes and inscribing the spheres and hemispheres. It's worth pointing out that physical distance is still irrelevant for these object graphs, with one key caveat. We don't want any sphere or hemisphere to touch another sphere or hemisphere. That includes the distance between object graph planes. I think it's pretty easy to see that the cell membrane model and this geometric model describe the same basic concepts. What works in the cell model works in the geometric model. Obviously the concept of being inside a cell converts to being inscribed in a plane, but being outside a cell just means you're in another plane. The geometric model has one advantage over the cell membrane model. If you want a third graph of objects and proxies, that's easy to visualize with a third plane. What I did is define a membrane to have as many object graphs as the application desires. Initially, the secure ECMAScript community called this a multi-sided membrane to distinguish it from the two-sided membrane where there was a wet side and a dry side. However, a later discussion led a parallel group called Fry AM to propose that the connections between object graphs is a type of hypergraph. Since then, I have personally settled on the name hypergraph membrane to distinguish this from an ordinary membrane. Hypergraph membranes have clear advantage over two-sided membranes, particularly in coordination between multi multiple parties. Earlier, I described one potential area of conflict with integrating components, but let's look over some more concrete examples. And this should be very familiar to Mark. Um, say we want Alice and Bob to share the same DOM tree, but each to only see their own expandos. We could have one membrane between the DOM and Alice and another between Bob and, Do and the DOM. Let's assume a third membrane between Bob and Alice so that Alice can interact safely, presumably, with Bob. If Alice sends a Bob her, a message carrying her proxy and the membranes are not coordinated, then Bob will receive a proxy for Alice's proxy for the DOM node. Through this proxy, Bob will see the view of the DOM node meant for Alice, not the view meant for Bob. Bob might see Alice's expandos. We don't want this. Even worse, let's say that Bob already has his own view through the membrane of this DOM node. Then when Alice sends him the message with her proxy, the proxy he receives as an argument in Alice's message would also point to this DOM node, but it would be a separate proxy altogether, two different ways of looking at the same object. This is really sloppy, and we don't want this either. With a hypergraph membrane, when Alice sends her message carrying her proxy 
it goes through the membrane to present a message carrying Bob's proxy, already cached. Bob's happy. We've gone through a lot of theory on membranes, but how do they actually work? Well, okay, the transit. I got to work on the transition here. Hypergraph membranes, in my in my opinion, are more efficient. In the three graph model, you have three two-sided membranes. With a fourth graph, you have six, and with five, you have ten. So, as you scale up the number of membranes, the number of of uh, I'm sorry, as you scale up the number of object, of object graphs, the number of membranes explodes at a squared rate. And keep in mind, you have two weak maps and two proxy handlers per two-sided membrane. Keeping them all synchronized is a headache that no one wants to go into. Um, for a hypergraph membrane, adding an extra graph actually is constant time, constant space consumed for it. Of course, you have to have more space for the individual proxies, but you create them on demand, so that's really not a problem. It's slightly more complex to implement, but membranes are very complex beasts to implement anyway. Membranes require a bit more bookkeeping, though. Um, for instance, when you have a function, you have to you have to wrap the function, you have to wrap all the arguments, including the this argument, pass it through to the membrane, run it uh, run it in the native graph as proxies. I'm sorry, as underlying objects. And then you wrap the return value so that it fits in the caller's object graph, probably as a proxy. There's also, how do you store the rules of the proxy? What kind of management manager for all this data is there? It's not just a vanilla object, although it could be. Um, it just gets more and more complicated and you kind of need something new. And that's where my ES membrane library comes in. Um, I spun it off of a dead project, uh, died a couple years ago, specifically to focus on membranes. Dr. Van Kutzum's work was the inspiration for this with the guidance of the secure ECMAS group, group of TC39. And it's the first implementation recognized as a hypergraph membrane with several optional distortion types built in as items you can apply on as on, uh, now I'm stuttering. So proxy mapping objects, they're the real secret sauce here. They do all the work of managing the data. You can think of them as JSON objects in a sense, except that they have functions. Okay, that's not a really good analogy, but they're data primarily um, with the exception of also having revoke methods that proxy.createRevocable provides to us. Here's how it works. We have the shadow, we have a proxy handler that takes a shadow target and then that points through the weak map to a proxy mapping object. The proxy mapping object stores the wet proxy data. I'm sorry, the wet object data, the original object, also the dry proxy data, including the revoke function, the shadow target, and other metadata on how that proxy should operate. And that results in a proxy for the for the dry graph. And the dry the proxy handler uses its shadow to point through the same through the weak map to the same proxy mapping. So instead of two weak maps, now it's down to one, and a secondary key for what object uh, what object graph you're pointing to. This allow this proxy mapping allows me to point to multiple graphs and scale up pretty easily. Um, as I mentioned, we have wet and dry. Damp is a third name that I came up with for a third object graph, and steamy is a fourth one I came up with. It, th again, those are just names. They have no meaning beyond the theory. The proxy handler traps, while they're well-defined and extremely carefully specified in JavaScript, are unfamiliar to 99% of JavaScript developers. Mozilla Developer Network, last I checked, had no good samples of correct code versus incorrect code. And it's very easy to accidentally overlook properties that you want to hide, distortions you want to set, especially when you consider how many objects you're trying to distort or potentially distort. There's top level objects and constructors, there's prototypes. There's instances of those constructors. There's arrays and sets and maps. 
it's it and then they're setting the same set of rules for multiple properties of multiple objects um, it, it, it's it's a mess um, I, I have a static GitHub web page to con provide configuration support. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm kind of evolving away from it. Um, Chip Morningstar, who's also a member of TC39, he compared this to configuring a firewall. And I think that's justifiable. Um, it's a knock, I admit it, but it's a justifiable one considering just how complex membranes are. ES membrane takes membrane installation from expert, meaning really, really, really deep in the internals to advanced. That doesn't say that it's easy to get right. So there's a little bit of work that is still to be done at the at the 30,000 foot level for ES membrane. Um, I brought up error stack traces in the original talk, but it's looking like TC39 is leaning against ever allowing that to formally be permitted. Um, the proxy what? What, 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 what say, make, state that again? There was a recent discussion on a uh, thread that I followed on uh, one of the TC39 mailing lists. Um, I, I don't remember which one it was, but I can cite it for you, Mark, later. That says forging an error stack trace, meaning ah. replacing it, should never, ever be permitted. Okay, I know, I know the thread you're talking about. Okay. Um, let, let me just say, uh, there's no conclusion there yet. Okay. Um, I kind of understand it, um, but it does mean that membranes in particular would not be able to hide some of the guts um, that happen, first of all, in the membrane, and second of all, in the foreign object graph, if we were okay. not able to do this. Yeah, it, the 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 key there is the if. Don't 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 assume that the um, that this issue is settled at this point. Okay. Um, okay, I will have to revise my slide. Um, there's also the proxy handler code which I wrote. Um, typically, I like to get things working and then optimize it, and that's what happened here. Um, it turned out that the proxy handler code got really long, really complicated, and integrates a whole bunch of different functionalities into the same single file. That was probably a tactical, I'm sorry, a strategic mistake. I'm trying to break that out into smaller components that are actually easier for plugging into each other. And then there's properly converting to ES6 modules, which I am a little late to the party on but it would also bring some benefits. There's also integrating with realms and frozen realms. Now these are new proposals that have not yet landed in JavaScript engines as far as I know. There's, it's ongoing work that is likely to happen but not quite in yet. These TC39 proposals are about providing copies of your top level globals, object, function, uh, string, date, number, Boolean, uh, etc., that users can manipulate without impacting the main script's globals. So you have your own completely separate set of these globals that if you change them, you won't hurt the original code in doing so. There's also standard distortions for collections. I mentioned arrays, maps, and sets. Um, in my opinion, if you start messing with the keys of an array, like you want to hide element four of an array. If you're not careful, you'll have zero, one, two, three, five, six, seven in your element in your arrays elements, and that can be less than desirable. Um, so that needs some special handling to behave the way we expect them to. Um, less complicated, but still relevant. Maps and sets might face the same kind of problem. And then uh, completely revisiting how we configure a membrane. Um, since the last time I gave this talk, I've learned a lot uh, through college. There's a possibility maybe engineers will write web IDL interfaces that we can parse and read in for configuring a for generating a configuration file. 
or maybe there might be membrane specific descriptors that engineers would put on their code. And then we could parse it with, with ESPRI and or a few other libraries to find those descriptors and extract from that the information we need to configure the membrane properly. Honestly, this is all open territory. I am completely open to any suggestions people might have on these. It's just kind of spitballing at this point. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for presenting. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, uh, since we're we're getting close to the end of the meeting, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you, everybody.